importance of putting our children into the proper environment as they're raised up. But by the way, that's not the only place you're going to find that. Throughout the Quran, you find reference to what Allah says about He has ordered you, ordered you to be dutiful to your parents, meaning to obey them, except when they have you to worship other than Allah. Assalamu alaikum. You see, ETE, and I like that. It fits so nice. You look at the internet website, ete.org.uk. Stands for something really important. We talk about educating the educators. Do we have any teachers amongst us today? Anybody that's ever taught part time or maybe out of your own home or full time? Do you have any teachers with us? I thought so. Quite a few. Have you ever noticed that when you're trying to prepare any kind of a speech, a lecture, or a lesson for someone, children or whatever, that you yourself begin to learn more about the subject? And often the teacher is the one learning the most. And this is something we'd really like to emphasize, is to educate our educators to the importance and the value of the Dean of Al-Islam and how it pertains to today's life that we live in. Islam is alive and it's now and it's ongoing. It's not something of a dead religion in the ancient times. Islam is for everyone, all people. Even people that are not Muslim, Islam can still benefit them. And all of these things we find when we study and break down the teachings of the Sharia of Islam. But I don't want to go too far into that as much as I would right now just like to emphasize the importance, the importance of putting our children into the proper environment as they're raised up. And let us consider what Allah tells us in the Quran. When He speaks to us in the subject in Surah Luqman about the importance of obeying our parents. But by the way, that's not the only place you're going to find that. Throughout the Quran, you find reference to what Allah says about He has ordered you, ordered you to be dutiful to your parents, meaning to obey them, except when they have you to worship other than Allah. So this is something very, very important. Islam does not call for us to cut off our relationships with our relatives next of kin just because we choose to believe in La ilaha illallah. For the benefit of many of you who perhaps chose to come to Islam, I want you to realize that it isn't right to cut off the relationship with your family. You need to hold on to that. That's an order in Islam. Be sure you understand that. And then for those of you who are raising children, let us look to the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he told us what is the state of Islam. And he compared the state of Islam to the consciousness of a child when he said that every child is born on the fitra, which means the natural inclination, the fitra of al-Islam. He said, but it's their parents who will raise them up to become some other religion, Christian, Jew, fire worshiper, or whatever. In Islam, we understand any child, any child who dies goes to paradise, regardless of the status of their parents. We don't have the concept in Islam of all children being born in the original sin of the parents. We don't start out with this hang-up of passing on sins and bad deeds. And actually, it's a mental ill health when you try to put that kind of teaching on a child. Rather, Islam says you start with a clean slate. Christianity, obviously, is nothing more than Islam twisted. Because Jesus, peace be upon him, John the Baptist, peace be upon him, they taught the same thing. Think about it. When you look to, again, what survives in the Bible of their book, it teaches us that they had the people to be baptized and then told them they were born again. Perhaps you've met some Christians who said they were born again. This is exactly what Islam says, that when you accept the correct belief in La ilaha illallah, there's only one God to worship. The God of Adam and Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, the God of Jesus, peace be upon all of them, the God of Muhammad, 
Sallallahu peace be upon him. And here, when we realize that we're using this term born again, it means to go back to the original status of what? Innocence, right? Pure, innocent. So if you're telling people to be born again, and you're telling them when you're born, you're born and in sin, what? That has a mental problem immediately. You mean you want me to go back to being a sinner again, huh? No. It is the natural teaching. The natural teaching of all the monotheistic religion. That when you come to the right belief, then everything becomes pure between you and your Lord. You get a new, fresh start on life. This is what Islam teaches, and this is what we want to work with with our children. Now watch. Today, our children are being exposed to a tremendous amount of information. Some good, some of it's good information. But there's an awful lot of it that's not good. The time that our children spend, the, that they use their time for, will determine it ultimately their personalities and how they turn out. I came to know that here in the UK we have the best opportunities for our youth of any of the non-Muslim countries in the world, and perhaps maybe of all the countries in the world, considering the condition of many of the Muslim countries, or so-called Muslim countries. What I look for when I consider the condition of these children, I look to see how they're developing. When I go to the prisons, and most of my work in the United States has been in the prisons, I've always been aware of the fact that very few of the Muslim youth ever, ever go to prison. In fact, I only saw one during the 1990s, one child. But I found here in the UK the opposite is true. Many of our youth are going to prison, and a lot of them for drugs. There's a reason for that. Some of you may have first-hand experience with a member of your family, or maybe even yourself, knowing what the effects of drugs are all about. Alcohol and drugs are really the outside. There's something even bigger inside that causes us to get into those kinds of problems. It means that inside we're not satisfied. We're not finding the bliss or the peace. So we're searching for that even to the extent that we're damaging our bodies, nay, even our minds, hoping to reach something, grasping, reaching, searching, because we haven't found it yet. It clearly indicates a lack of the proper understanding of Islam and what it teaches us. Therefore, I want to share with you a little story before I'm finished. You didn't know I was done, did you? It was just a reminder for us to think about. But I want to share a story with you. A number of years ago, I was the emir for a, a masala a masjid on the Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. And a brother from Saudi Arabia came up to me. He was a sergeant in their military. They go over there, by the way, to learn English. And he was all excited. He came up to me in the masjid. He said, ah, this is the best day of my life. I'm so excited. I said, really? What happened? I thought maybe you got a wife or something, you know? <laughs> and he said, I just put my son in American public school. I said, what? He said, I'm all excited. I just today put my son in American public school. I said, why didn't you put him in the toilet? <laughs> I could stop right there. I figured you've already got the whole thing. You understood it. But I'll go ahead and tell you the story anyway. But you understood exactly. He looked at me and he, he puzzled on his face. He said, huh? I said, why don't you put him in the toilet? He said, no, you don't understand. I'm saying I put my son in the American public school. I said, listen, I speak English. I understood what you said. But I'll help you with Arabic. Hammam, toilet. Why didn't you put him in the toilet? Because at least you could wash it off. This man turned and walked away from me, shaking his head like, you know, these Americans, they don't know anything. That same man, I met his son. His son is named Turkey. And his son and he were in the masjid that weekend. Then on Monday evening, he came back at Maghrib time, shaking his head. I said, what's the matter? He said, oh, I've had some problem at the school. I said, already, first day. 
He said, yeah, they, they won't let my son use his name. I said, why? He said, because his name is Turkey. He's, they're afraid, you know, they're going to make fun of him and it's a problem. So they want to call him Fred. I said, what? Yeah, they said Fred is a better name than Turkey. I said, well, let's see if we can come to some resolution. And by the way, they came up with the idea to use his second name, which is Omar. Now, without going into too much of the details of what happened over the years, I relocated in Washington, D.C., maybe seven or eight years later. And when I was there in Washington, I went to a gas pump, putting some fuel in the car. By the way, you guys pay about four times what we pay for that stuff, you know that? Bad. <laughs> we thought we had a problem. So he came up to me and he said, Sheikh Yusuf. I said, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. He said, I need your phone number. I said, okay. He said, I have something I need to talk to you. He called me up. He said, okay, I need you to come over to my house. So I took a friend of mine and we went over to his house. On the way over, I told my friend the story of what had happened. When we got there, we sat on the floor. He gave us the tea and everything. We were sitting there and he said, do you remember, do you recall the first words you said to me the day I met you? I said, oh yeah, I remember real well. He said, do you remember what you said? I said, yes, I remember what I said. He said, you told me I would have been better off to put my son in a toilet than the American public school. I said, that's what I said. And I meant it. My mother spent nearly 40 years in the American public school system as an educator, writing curriculum. My father worked in education. I even had my own little bout with it. For sure, without doubt, I still feel the same way. He said, well, you didn't say the right thing. I said, really? Okay. He said, yeah. He said, you made a mistake. And I said, okay. Maybe I did. I make lots of them. He said, you should have told me it was 10 times worse to put him in public school than to put him in the toilet. I said, really? He said, yes, and he started crying. He said, I don't know where my son even is anymore. We gave him a car and he disappeared. We gave him a cell phone and he uses it. We don't know who he's talking to, where he's going, what's going on with this boy. We had a meeting. We tried to talk to the boy, see what we could do to fix things. A few months later, another meeting, the father broke into tears. He came to my place and he told me then, he said, my son has disappeared now. The gang that he hangs out with, I don't know about them. I don't know what's up with that. Long story short, maybe it's too late for that, <laughs> is that finally we were able to get a hold of the boy. The boy was okay. There was a problem that the father was expecting this boy to take this education, which he valued very highly, along with the traditions of being from Saudi Arabia and somehow blend these two things together and make the perfect person. That's never gonna happen. We don't have time for a whole long lecture on the subject, but I would like to just touch something and then let you go to our website to find out more about it. The subject is harsh questions. Your child, my child, you may be yourself. Probably you've been confronted with questions when people come to you and they'll ask you something like how come you in a religion that tells you to beat your wives by the way that's a Texas accent <laughs> how come in your religion you have to kill all the Jews and Christians oh. why does your book tell you not to even take Jews and Christians for friends how come a man can have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? How come you guys talk about worshiping a God and then all you do is pray to a black box in the desert? Have you heard that one? How come you kiss the ground five times a day? What's amazing though, check this out. If you take the time, you, you have to study. You cannot just take a pill and wake up in the morning and you understand what's Islam. It's not supposed to be that way. Allah wants you to spend your time, energy, and resources to learn about his deen. That's very clear. He created you, put you here, gave you opportunities. You have opportunities to learn just as your children do. But if you fail to do so, then why are you surprised when you're not able to answer these questions? In fact, 
and I'm not going to give you the answer to all of these, but many times, over and over and over, when we gave the proper answer to the people, not only did they become very happy with Islam, some of them made shahada on the spot. One example is a very clear one. Two Catholic girls came to me after one of our programs, and they were complaining. They were going to university there in Florida, where I was lecturing, and they said, we are complaining to you about only one subject. I said, you listen to our subject. We talked about God is one. He has no partners. La ilaha illallah. You like all of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have a problem with that. Well, we have one subject. I said, okay, that's great. Because it means if we get over past that subject, I guess you'll like Islam then, won't you? And they went, huh? They said, we want to know why do you have a petition between the men and the women? I said, so when we answer this question, if you like the answer, you're going to be ready to be a Muslim, huh? They went, huh? So it's the only question you have? Well, let me ask you a question. What religion are you? They said Catholic. I said, okay. Who are the best of the best of your women? They said the nuns. I said, oh, that's good. You're right. And how do they dress? Don't they wear this covering? All of They said, no, 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 we're not asking about dress. No, we like, there's nothing wrong with the dress of the women, of the Muslims. No, that's, that's not our subject. We're asking about this partition. I said, okay, I understand you. But I'm asking about those women for a reason. They're the best of your women, yes? Yeah. I said, uh, can they have a baby? <gasps> oh, no. I said, why? They can't get married. I said, why? They said, because they're married to God. I said, what? They said, they're married to God. I said, all of them? They said, yeah. I said, and you guys have a problem with us with four wives and your God has how many? I don't know. Just. <laughs> but let's pursue this a bit further. You see, the best of the best of our Muslim sisters also dress like that. They wear the same exact thing. They're covering everything except the face and their hands. Some are even covering their faces. And by the way, some of the nuns in the orders, a part of their habit, we call it hijab, they call it habit, also covered their faces. They said, no, 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 this is not the problem. I said, no, yes, it is. Listen close. The nun, when she wears those clothes, when does she wear it? One of them said, I don't know. The other one said, I guess they wear it all the time. I said, that's right. From the time they wake up in the morning till the time they go to bed, every single day from the day they enter into the convent until they die, they never, ever go around without their habit. For what, 2,000 years or how long they've had this going on, this has been their custom. Even when they're in a convent with nothing but women, they still wear it except when they go to sleep or take a bath. That's the only time they take it off. On the other hand, our best of the best of the women never have to wear the habit or hijab, except if there are men who are present who don't have any business looking at them. That's the only time they wear it. The rest of the time, they can just relax, wear anything they like to wear, up to them. They said, really? I said, absolutely. But there's a point that I ask you about the babies. Because you see, there's no need for these nuns to ever worry about this because they're never going to have a baby. Isn't that true? Our sisters, on the other hand, are encouraged to get married as soon as they're old enough. And when they do, obviously they have children. They have babies. And when a mother has her baby, she has to feed it. So if she would like to feed her baby, there's no problem because she's sitting on the other side of this wall. It's for ladies only. Ladies can remove their covering. She can uncover herself to feed her baby and nobody's going to see anything. And it's a courtesy that we put up there for the ladies. They said, oh, we didn't know that. I said, well, which one makes more sense? They said, this does. I said, yeah. Now, before I leave, do you mind if I ask you another question? They said, go ahead. I said, who are the best of the best of your men? They said, the priests. I said, and who's better than a priest? They said, we don't know. I said, archpriest, bishop, archbishop, cardinal, and pope. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can they get married? They said, no. Are they married to God, too?
no answer. I said, now, you're talking about literally millions of men and women throughout these centuries who are the best of the best of your people, who have never even been allowed to get married, to have intimacy, to grow old together with someone who loves them throughout their life, never have the bond of marriage, attending so many other marriages, christenings of babies, yet they can't participate, not legally, not according to your church. They can't have children, they can't have grandchildren. They don't have that and they will never have it. The girls were looking down like, well, yeah, that's uh, bad, isn't it? I said, and then finally, it comes in my mind that if the best of the best of your men and the best of the best of your women are totally celibate and cut off from a natural relationship. They'll never have any children, so it only means that the worst of the worst of your people continue to propagate children on this earth, and in the very end you'll have nothing but trash and garbage. I said, have a nice life, and I walked off. It struck me so hard the value of Islam in this incident, that I used this exact program that I attend over and over. I talked about it in so many lectures to show the reality of how Islam is logical. It's not a man-made religion. It is from your Lord. And subhanAllah, a year later or so, I was back down in the same place in Melbourne, Florida. And I was telling them, you know, the last time I was here, there were two girls asking a question about this petition. And after I got done and I told them the whole story, all through the story, the brothers and sisters, they were laughing like, ha, 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 ha. And more than you guys even. And I couldn't figure out why they're laughing so hard. When I got done, they said, Sheikh, the girls came back. They made shahada. They're on the other side of the petition listening to you right now. And alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, hu Allah di jalan muslimin. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us Muslim. And we thank him so much for guiding us to this beautiful deen, this way of life. Islam is not the problem. Islam is the solution. Muslims were the problem. But if we'll take a little of that medicine of the solution, spend a little time educating ourselves and sharing that with others, who knows? Maybe the rest of the world will see the beautiful solution in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.